Margaret and I are your current program team, and we are thrilled to have engaged boy Sally Biswas. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. I think so. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, I practice um, to present to us. I see uh, many people who saw her just enchanting talk yesterday. Uh, some of you who couldn't, you're in for a treat. Um, boy Sally uh, grew up in India and went to school at a college that was kind of magical. She may tell us a little more about it. Uh, her cultural um, roots are deep in India. She just came back from visiting her, her mother. Um, and the college there, um, it has inspired her. She does, I was just amazed yesterday, Bosali, about how many different things you do and do so well. So Thank she you. weaves, she quilts, she embroiders, she paints. She, I guess, describes herself as a surface artist, mostly visual, beautiful things, but some beautiful wearables or functional art. But um, So I'm not going to take any more time. Uh, welcome to our speaker who is coming to us from Michigan, where I went to law school and lived for quite a while. So there's that um connection welcome thank you <laughs> thank you jane thank you all for inviting me and this is a real pleasure to be here again today um as jane introduced me i grew up in india but i have spent more than half my life here in this country now so i have been here a long time more than 30 years now Mm. And uh, I started my journey in India, but then um, most of my journey was advanced over here. So um, I would say that I learned a lot more through practice and um, also during my MFA over here. Um, so I'm going to talk today about um, the materials and the techniques I use. I call myself a multimedia hmm, fiber artist. Um, so be because I work in a lot of different uh, techniques and materials within the uh, fiber medium. Uh, you might have questions when I'm explaining the techniques a little bit. Um, since I'm not doing any videos or uh, workshop like thing, I'm going to explain through my pieces. So. Hopefully, you'll be able to understand what I'm talking about. If not, you can always ask me questions uh, now or later also. Uh, someone says, where in India is home? I'm from Calcutta um, in uh, eastern Michigan. Uh, eastern India, I'm <laughs> sorry. Uh, from Calcutta, um, right on near, on the uh, almost on the coast of uh, Eastern India. So shall I share my screen now? Okay, so this pretty much is a collage of a lot of my pieces, not all, but few. I found this um, in the computer, so I used it as a title slide. Um, this has all different kinds of work in it. I'm going to start uh, with needle weaving since that's where I started my journey um, when I didn't have a floor loom. And this, the piece on the right here, you see, that was the first needle weaving that I was taught to do. And um, basically, we took a frame and uh, hammered nails on all four sides at the back, and we made a grid of these one and a half inch squares. And uh, within those small squares, we uh, did needle weaving and we did these different patterns. So that's where my journey of weaving started basically because um, we didn't have a loom back then. Um, in India is a vast country with a rich heritage of textiles, but having owning looms like people like us it was not very common the looms were belong to the weavers and there were there are a huge community of uh, weavers back there 
so this is where we i started my journey and i learned to weave with the with a small needle and uh, like very fine yarns on this little frame here this goes back to about um more than 30 years and this one on the left is a new uh, frame loom I found on Amazon. I just finished my artist in residency at a nearby art center in Michigan, where part of the residency was I had to do uh, workshops with the community. So I was thinking what I can do, but I wanted to do something playful with them because the workshop was going to be just for uh, three hours. So that there was not much time. So I found these beautiful little looms on lap looms yeah. on Amazon. And uh, this was my sample on the loom, but people experimented on the loom. And um, my aim was to introduce different materials in weaving. Um, I always like to use different materials other than just yarns in my weaving. So that was the main um, purpose of this workshop that you can use anything for the weft basically i kind of emphasize that the warp has to be a nice strong cotton warp but the weft i introduce a lot of materials like um a wire and uh, twigs leaves anything like grasses different kinds of grass and other materials too which are like throw away materials, even paper and anything that you can weave with. Basically, if you can put it in the shed of your warp, I pretty much use it. So this was my next step in the needle weaving. I made the grids bigger and the frames much bigger. And I took each space and I wove in that. This was, again, like this goes back to like almost 30 years. Then I was a little more adventurous. I stepped out of the square and rectangular grids and I made these, um, these shapes, which I took each, each space became a weaving space for me. And I worked with the negative and the positive spaces and I wove in little um, of those shapes, the, the little shapes, I did some crochet, I did some weaving, and uh, anything that I could weave with went into this uh, experimental piece over here. Then I went a little larger, and these frames were about three feet by two and a half feet, and the warp was one continuous warp in the, uh, in, on the frames. And I again wove with needles and I used a um, um, lot of printed textiles like saris and stoles. My mom's uh, saris, which were it, typically saris are about six yards long. So I cut them into strips and I used them with a big fat needle to weave with. And with the printed saris, I got these beautiful textures in the, in the weaving. As you can see over here, all these textures come from the printed uh, saris. You must, many of you might have woven with rags, you call rag weaving. This is similar to that, uh, but I didn't do it on a loom. I did it on this frame and with a big fat needle. So these are two of my students from the, from last week. The, worked on those little frame looms and I just wanted to show you two samples that they came up with. You can see they use some copper strips that I had for them and uh, some sisal and some skewers. I had more materials but since they were doing it for the first time they were not very comfortable using other materials. Um, yesterday I talked about these assemblages, which uh, I combine my surface design with my weaving because I like doing both of them. I love to weave and I, I also like to manipulate fabrics uh, with different um, techniques like screen printing and uh, shibori, dyeing and um, block printing, all kinds of uh, fiber, like surface design techniques. So I love to work on pieces 
they become quite complex at the end because I combine my weaving with my surface design. And in most of these pieces, um, I start with an idea, but I bring out all my fabrics and my woven scraps and I see what works and what doesn't. And um, that's where I start. But something like this in a piece like this, this is pretty big about um, five and a half by four. I started with this big piece of black fabric. Um, someone asked me what discharge is uh, yesterday. I use discharge technique over here. Discharge typically is when you use a bleaching kind of agent, it takes off the dye from a dark fabric. So what I did to this black fabric was I scrunched it up like how you would tie dye a fabric and I dipped it in dye, in uh, bleach, I'm sorry, in bleach. So the bleach took off some of the black uh, dye from the fabric and I got this beautiful rich brown. So uh, if you're bleaching fabric, don't ever use silk or polyester or anything. It has to be natural fabric. It has to be either cotton or rayon. But I would recommend uh, testing it first if you're ever going to try bleaching your fabric. And uh, you have to be very careful. You have to, I'm sorry, you have to uh, tie it real tight because bleach kind of penetrates into the fabric very fast. And um, look up the process of doing it on, uh, you'll find it online, you'll find it in uh, books on surface design. Uh, there are other chemicals right uh, available with these. I don't know if you shop with uh, Dharma Trading Company in California and ProChem on the East Coast. They sell these uh, different discharging uh, chemicals that you can use to take off the dye from your fabric. So in this, I discharge the black fabric and then these areas were screen printed with another chemical called um, thiox, which takes off the dye from the fabric. So I blocked these black areas with stencils and I screen printed over that to get the lighter area. So it took off the color a little more. And I combined with my weaving uh, th this is called wrapping, which I wrapped with yarns on sisal and I sewed it on the, um, on the panel over here. Uh, there are some wooden beads, which I uh, colored, I dyed them and um, sewed them onto the fabric. And this is all hand quilted. Uh, this is a different uh, woven piece by me. And this piece is woven with reed. Uh, reed is something that you weave baskets with. It's a natural material and you can dye it with uh, Prussian dyes. So this is pretty much a quite a complex um, assemblage. I would say this has applique in it and this is all hand quilted. Um, This is another assemblage where uh, I wove the center um, square over here with a little tapestry in between over here, which has two ceramic pieces, uh, which I introduced into the shed when I was weaving. And these pieces at the side, they all started out white. I dyed and screen printed, um, block printed, and I embroidered on, I, most of it is machine um, embroidery and it's hand quilted too. So it's another combination of weaving and surface design. It's a good example of that. And um, this is a quilt actually, but as I said yesterday, it's not a perfect pieced quilt. It's my version of an art quilt. Uh, so I combine my weaving with um, fabrics. 
This is another complex piece which has uh, weaving and surface design. Mm, it's, uh, it has these panels which are the orange color. It comes from, I mentioned yesterday, I weave a lot with uh, onion uh, net bags. The, the net bags that we buy onions in, I weave with those bags. And since they are orange in color and they cannot be dyed, um, some of my pieces are very orange in color. I, I like the color orange, so it works for me. But in this uh, kind of, that orange kind of dictated the color of the piece. And this panel on the right is shibori and discharged. Again, it was a black fabric and uh, it was discharged with bleach. And these are woven panels and the, this was shibori dyed again and it was hand embroidered with just plain running stitch and these panels are um, painted on paper and they were cut up and woven i will come to that technique later which i call painted weaving um, so this has pieces of uh, panels of paper woven, weaving in it painting and hand embroidery um and what else uh, yeah that's pretty much it this is another uh, complex piece and you see a, see some close ups at the side it has some applique over here also and some other appliques over here it has these are applique and then embroidered on uh, on the fabrics boy boy Sally, can you yeah. Talk about the inspiration with your parents and the clothesline. Oh, yeah. Line. yeah. And thank you for that. reminding me. <laughs> yeah, this is inspired by my um, hometown, basically. Uh, this was when my father was sick and I could, could not visit him very often. And uh, this reminds me of my hometown. And my uh, parents used to live in a multi storied building. Uh, with kind of apart, they are like apartments and uh, windows and doors and balconies. So whenever I think of home, um, the balconies and the rooftops and the clotheslines are come into my memory all the time because we use clothesline over there. Hardly ever dryers are used because it's a very warm country. So whenever you look out from the balcony and from the rooftops, you see these clotheslines. And so whenever I think of home, uh, that's what first comes to mind. And then the crows, uh, we have a lot of crows there. Um, and the multi-story buildings, I, whenever I think of them, I think of the windows and also the parents who have been, a lot of parents um, don't have their children there anymore. They live by themselves. So all those things come to mind whenever I think of my hometown and this, I did a whole series of um, these pieces um, when my father was sick and as whenever I thought of home, I could see my parents at the balcony. So I did about seven or eight pieces which were inspired by that whole um, reminiscing my hometown. So this is one of them. Thank you, Jane, for reminding me. <laughs> uh, this is another um, complex piece, which I call Kolkata Chronicles. Kolkata is uh, the name of my city. And um, this, again, is inspired by those um, multi-story buildings and the windows and the balconies. It's a very complex piece. And... Um, it has a lot of surface design, weaving, uh, embroidery, uh, with different materials. Uh, this piece at the center is uh, styrofoam. And that's why I've included a close up to show you that I have, I usually paint the styrofoam and also cover it with uh, fabric or paper with decoupage to make it strong basically. And I don't like the styrofoam to be exposed anywhere because it is fragile. So here is a side view of the styrofoam and 
I try not to cut it. When I see one interesting piece with windows or uh, a much simpler shape, I kind of save it for using it in some way in my work because it doesn't um, biodegrade. It's not recyclable. I try to use materials that um, are not good for the environment, basically. I don't like to discard th these things. And as far as materials, something like this, I, I save all my scraps from my work. I don't throw out anything. I save everything. And so when I, whenever I'm working on a complex piece like this, I bring out my scraps and whatever works, I try to use it in my piece. So I have a few bins full of fabric scraps and woven scraps. So I use them in whatever way I can. Um, sometimes I do make new fabrics or new weavings for a particular piece, but in this one, I happen to find everything in my stash bin and I put them uh, together. Uh, this is the piece in process, work in process. You can see the styrofoam over here. Uh, I painted that and then I covered the sides with uh, fabric too. So this was uh, previous to the uh, one that you saw. This is when it was laid on the table. You can see the hand stitching um, that was stretched on a, this piece was stretched on a, um, on a framed canvas. So it is, this is one of the few pieces that is actually stretched on frames. Usually I don't frame my work, but uh, because of the styrofoam and the nature of the work, I had to stretch this on a canvas. So it is quilted in a lot of areas. This is before the hand quilting when I was putting together the scraps and the fabrics. Uh, this is another... Uh, in which uh, you can easily see that how I used my scraps from my stash. And uh, it's, again, a combination of weaving and fabric. This is a good sh example of shibori. Uh, some are screen printed. And uh, these are, e I don't know if any of you have tried ikat weaving. This is ikat. And um, I have woven with wire in this. And that's why it is shaped. I've used the fringes over here. Some are, some of the fabrics here are commercial fabrics, but very few. But most of them I have either uh, printed or uh, woven. This is paper over here in the middle. There's a question in the chat. Um, what kind of paint and glue do you use when covering the styrofoam? I, I use acrylic. But uh, before I use the acrylic, I cover it with uh, just simple bounty, actually. Paper, um, it works very well. Bounty works really fine. I, I kind of soak that in water and spread it on the styrofoam and then cover it with decoupage, with Mod Podge kind of thing. And after it dries completely, that's when I uh, paint with acrylic. So this is, uh, this is paper over here and over here also is paper which, is, uh, which has been painted and woven. I'll come to that technique later, but um, I do have panels of the paper weaving over here. And some of it is ikat and this is another uh, discharge with shibori. And this is uh, shibori with dyes. It is not discharge shibori it's a uh, shibori with uh, two or three dyes i have any of you done shibori uh tie dye yeah it's a very interesting technique this is uh, basically pole wrapping i don't know if you have done any of you have done pole wrapping on pvc pipe you scrunch the fabric and you dunk it in a dye pot i have it doesn't yeah. look that good but i have 
it i think you have to do a lot to get and it's very accidental even i am not very good at it because i don't don't do so much so sometimes they are really good and sometimes they don't come out as good <laughs> uh this is another complex piece which has um mostly weaving little bit of fabric in it but this is ikat and uh this has a little paper weaving over here and some uh fabrics very little but it is painted warp mainly i don't know if you have any of you have done painted warp um where you warp the on the warping board you can lay it on a table and uh, paint it on a table with dyes before you put it on the loom or you can put it on the loom and then put a board underneath the warp and paint as you weave i have done both the techniques and um, i think i like uh, to lay it on the table and paint on it it's uh, you get little more uh, even dyes from even, even colors with that technique so this these panels are painted warp and this is ikat and then this is heavily embroidered as you can see all it's just with plain running stitch and uh, it's heavily embroidered and uh, this is a little bound weave over here a scrap of a uh, bound weave and what else do i have i have sometimes i use the onion net for layering also because it kind of gives a very subtle layer and uh makes it more uh, softer i think the surface and then in this i've gone back and added some silk organza these are applique over here these square patches that you see uh you can see the embroidery through those through the orange uh, through the organza and these are applique pieces over there um yeah any questions about this how do you come up with these ideas this is wonderful thank you um i i don't know <laughs> i with these of course i start somewhere i start with a big i lay a big fabric on the table and then i as i said i bring out all my stash and scraps and then lay them that takes the longest time i think to determine what i'm what is going to go with what uh, and and slowly it emerges i think but yeah these are little complex pieces and it takes a while to come up with the composition and with the whole uh, layout as a whole i do a little bit of sketching for on some pieces but uh, not that much actually because it evolves as i as i work on it um these are two examples just to show you this is a piece where i i'll come to the paper weaving later and when i show you that you will know what i'm talking about but this piece particular piece was one of my beginning paper weavings in which i also did a little bit of tapestries over here little small tapestries and then that whole piece didn't work for me it was just the painted the background with these small tapestries so i do that with lot of my pieces which don't work for me i just keep them aside and they stay there sometimes for years and i bring them out one fine day and i start working like transforming it completely so i added all these pieces to it later and finally it worked for me uh so this was a completely new um woven piece that was sitting in my studio and this was a silk organza that i uh added some uh sisal and i i stitched onto the fabric because i didn't like this background over here what was going on over here what what's the size of that piece of this one uh this is about less than 2 feet wide these uh i use these paintable wallpaper 
the width of those rolls are uh, 22 inches. So these, most of my pieces of the wallpaper weaving are like about 22 inches wide, but the length varies. Now, this piece on the right, I brought it to, sh I just wanted to show you that these are those spools, the cardboard spools that are, that are wound with the yarns. I don't throw those also, and then I wrapped it with yarn and used with two end pieces of weaving that I had in my studio and made, made this collage, and uh, these are stitched onto the weaving. And uh, this was a little bit of ikath weaving. So these are those cardboard spools that uh, we buy yarns in. Uh, this is painted warp. Uh, this is laid on the table and this is after the weaving. Uh, after washing the dyes uh, wash out a little bit, there's not as vibrant. Um, but if you fix it well, then if you steam it and all that, you, you don't lose as much of the dyes as um, much. So it pretty much stays as vibrant. Only the excess dye washes out. Uh, this is another uh, grouping with a painted warp. And uh, this has been embroidered. These pieces are about a Mm, about 12 inches square and they have applique with silk organza and they are heavily embroidered as you can see. Uh, these are my painted weavings. Um, this is where the idea originated because I had like boxes full of those duplicate photographs that we used to get before. Um, and many of them didn't go into the make it to the album. So one fine day I decided to shred them and weave with them. So that is where the idea uh, came from, weaving with paper. Uh, the warp was a, just a plain cotton warp. And I shredded these photographs and I put them back to back and uh, used them as the weft and I made this into a mobile. So that is where uh, the paper weaving started. Then the next one was I enlarged a photograph of my kids and I wove with that. Um, but I didn't like to weave with that. It was, it was very kind of slippery. It didn't have a body to it. Um, it was not easy to weave with. Maybe if I, if I would have put a backing to it uh, with some heavier paper or something, it would work better. But uh, the surface was not uh, very good to weave with. So I decided to, I thought, why not paint on, say, watercolor paper or something and uh, try to weave with that. And at that time, I found uh, this paintable wallpaper, uh, which comes in white, but it has a lot of beautiful textures. And you get different textures on the wallpaper. So what I do is I paint on the wallpaper like I'm paint painting on canvases. I sometimes do collage on them. And after the paint painting is complete, that's when I... Uh, start cutting them into strips and weave with them. So this is to show you the painting process. Um, I put a lot of layers of acrylic paint, very diluted acrylic paint, because there are a lot of these uh, crevices which um, if you apply thick dye, then a thick paint, it doesn't get into those crevices. So I, these have a lot of layers of paint, basically. So these are some of my very beginning paper weavings where when I used to cut them in straight strips, and you can see I used much thicker war, um, yarns for the warp and much closer to, and these were, I think, three by two at that time. And, um, and I used to cut straight strips. 
So this whole technique kind of evolved over the years. I have been doing it for like maybe over 10 years now. So the whole process um, has evolved a lot since then. This is again one of the beginning weavings and I was still cutting the uh, strips straight and weaving with them. Um, this I didn't like after weaving it, so I wove two other panels and attached them to the base and stuffed it with um, a batting basically to hold it in uh, shape and this is a 3D, uh, this has a 3D surface. This again, uh, to show you the painting and the weaving after it was woven and someone bought this piece. This is not a good picture of this. The painting is better. It, it's a better, better picture than the weaving. I couldn't find a good uh, woven picture. But even then, I was using much thicker yarns for the warp and it showed a lot more on the surface. This is more recent. Uh, you can see the painting. And this was a triptych that uh, I was working on a commission for a friend. And this is about, um, I think, about seven feet wide, this whole thing. So I painted the whole painting as one piece. And then after I was done with it, I cut it up in three uh, pieces. and. And there you can see weaving one of the panels. It's These are on the looms. And this is another piece. So after I gradually, I started um, cutting them like in wavy strips because it was giving more of an organic look than the straight lines. And what I do is I uh, we, we put in a um, narrow, uh, thin piece of yarn in between the strips so that it holds the strips in place. And I also put a paper backing at the back of the wallpaper. Uh, it's just brown craft paper, um, which gives it a body and some thickness to the wallpaper and makes it stronger too. So I cut it up with just with scissors and um, I don't make any uh, sketches or anything. I just cut it as I go and put it and weave it at almost like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. So this is the woven uh, painting. And I have started using very thin yarn now for the warp, which is just by uh, 220. It's a black yarn I use most of the time. And so it just creates a kind of a layer on top. Uh, it doesn't show very well on the on in pictures. Um, yeah, this you can see the warp a little bit. And I have used just scrunched up yarn in between um, the paper too in this one. So that kind of stretches the paint, painting a little bit. And these were done previously than the uh, one you saw earlier. That were more. That was more recent. So these are some examples of the paper weaving. These two I have mounted on fabric and stretched on canvases. Um, not always I do that, but for these particular uh, ones, I did it. And this was af after I did paint it with the wall on the wallpaper, I added some cheesecloth. Can you see the texture of the cheesecloth? Um, that was on the wallpaper because sometimes the wallpaper texture is too much and I don't like it in all places. So I cover it with other paper or other textures. And in these two, I used a cheesecloth and painted over it. And then I cut it up and wove with that. And you can see some of the warp yarns in this. So what it does is basically it creates um, 
separate layer on top and it gives a different dimension altogether after the weaving. These are other two examples. I sometimes just add uh, small woven pieces on the surface to give it a 3D effect. Uh, in this, I've used some of the netting, the fruit netting while weaving with the paper. So it's a uh, very mixed media kind of weaving. This would these type of things. And this, this is wrapping on sisal with yarn and I use that as a weft too. Uh, these are some examples of pins I was making, little woven pins. And uh, you can see in the previous one, I've attached one of those onto the wallpaper weaving. And even over here. How big are those pins? Uh, these are about these are about one one and a half inch by one and a half. Tiny. Thank you. Yeah, tiny pins, and they are stuffed inside with a little bit of batting, and uh, they are double layered basically. And some of them have copper, as you can see, copper strips, and some reed also in between. This is another example of painted weaving. You can see the textures a little more and the warp on the surface. This is another close up uh, of a bigger piece. This is uh, basically showing you that um, I weave with all different kinds of materials. This whole installation, it is about uh, each panel is, panel is about seven feet long and about uh, four inches wide. And most of it is woven with the net bags, with the uh, onion bags and the lemon bags and uh, different kinds of fruit netting. And uh, that kind of dictated the color scheme of the of the installation. And I call it a growing installation because every time I install it in a, at a different place, I add some more panels to it and try to make them different so that the whole entire look kind of changes um, of the whole installation. These are some of my some of those uh, onion bags and the avocado bags and the lemon bags that I my friends collect and even I collect and use them in my weaving. Um, these are some of my oven stash. Some of them, like some of those assemblages, I have pieces which go back to almost 20, 25 years, and then some are more recent. So I have no time frame for those. When people ask me how long did it take you to make one of those, I just don't have an answer <laughs> because those woven pieces might have been done like 20 years back. These are some examples of the fruit netting that I use in my weaving. And this has some wires so that I could shape them because of the wire. I take them off the loom and I could uh, shape it. This is the entire installation at um, Urban Institute of Contemporary Art at Grand Rapids. This was earlier this year and it was there for about six months. This entire space was that whole corner was the whole installation basically. And it had about 42 of those panels. And uh, for for that installation, I added these panels, which uh, I stitched with ginkgo leaves on it. I wove with maple seeds and some wheat grass too. Here you can see the wheat grass and uh, maple leaves. I inserted them during the weaving. And uh, these were ginkgo leaves, which I didn't weave with, but 
I stitched them after I took them off the loom. And this is an example to show you how I use the netting. This is a good example to show how I sometimes transform my older work. This one on the left is was about maybe 25 years back I had done that. I, I liked it then, but then later I, I just didn't like it anymore. So it was sitting in a corner in a box for many years. And then one day I took it out and I transformed it completely into this piece. I added a little uh, weaving at the bottom and I shaped it completely. And it's now a totally a 3D kind of uh, almost like a figurine. Um, and you can see the transformation. So that's something I really like about the medium is you can transform a piece completely by taking it apart or adding things to it or um, adding other materials and techniques also with it. And I do that, I do that often with many of my pieces. This is a kind of 3D weaving I was doing at one time, which are um, three or four layer of weaving together, like how you, you um, can weave double cloth. I don't know where I got the draft from. I think I have it somewhere, but it was three layers of weaving at the same time. And you can do it with yarns, but I did it with yarns and reed. And what I did with the weaving later, I, when I took it off the loom, I soaked the whole thing in water. And with, with the, uh, weaving with the reed, it softens them up. And when you soak it in water, you can shape it after you take it off. If you bend it and leave it tied like that, it stays like that. So this was real fun thing to do, I think. I, it was It all looked flat when it came off the loom but when I could shape it it uh, looked like baskets almost so they were very three-dimensional uh, this one over here was uh, the four layers were woven with raffia but raffia doesn't give that uh, body to it and it I could not shape it that much they were much softer and uh, not as hard as the reed These are much newer pieces. Again, this one on the left, it showed it first I had made it like this, a flat piece, and it was in a gallery for some time. Um, then I requested to send it back and then I reshaped it like this. I soaked it in water and at this uh, over here, I tied it with yarns and left it overnight to dry like that and it became completely different piece altogether and this was part of my uh, recent show which came down last week. The same with this piece over here, I reshaped it and transformed it completely. Boy Sally, these, yeah. would, oh, these two, to talk about the shadows. Oh yeah. Yeah, these, uh, this for this one over here, first I didn't um hang it so much away from the wall now with my shadow i'll come to that later actually because nowadays what i'm doing is i'm weaving more with translucent weaving and when i hang them away from the wall about six or seven inches away they create beautiful shadows so even in this one you can see that it it wasn't creating as much a good shadow as this one when I transformed it and I hung it more away from the wall this was about seven inches away from the wall so you can see the different shadows with the if it has proper lighting of course uh, but I try to do very translucent weaving where you can see the light through and I have some opaque areas in the weaving which I do with inlay weaving and uh, those create shapes on the wall with the um, when we get the good shadows. 
Uh, this I I'm showing it to you because you can see the top over here. I this was a part of a I call it a wishing tree. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the wishing tree in um, all over the world. In many countries, people tie these uh, uh, ribbons or fabrics to trees and they wish for something. And a wishing tree is a thing which you can go to all different. It's a very ancient practice and we have seen it in many different countries on our travels. And that kind of intrigues me how it's such an ancient practice, but how it is commonly uh, practiced all over the world. So uh, the wishing tree idea came from that. And I had, this was I about two years back, I did this. This was again styrofoam for my recent um, show, which came down last week. I transformed that styrofoam. I repainted it and I attached a different piece to it. But I used the same uh, woven branch on top. And here is a close up of that. This styrofoam was again decoupaged with um, bounty paper towel and then painted with acrylic on top. This again is woven with reed and shaped and it has copper strips on it and other things going on. This is a branch which has been wrapped in uh, with yarns. Um, this piece on the right is also a similar piece which has been woven with yarn and shaped like a 3D. And uh, because of the 3D shapes and the reed, you, uh, those, you can see the beautiful shadows on the wall. Mm, this was, I created these ceramic pieces which I wove on the loom with them as you can see in the weaving. Uh, but they had, it has to be done in small pieces and then taken off the loom. You cannot really roll it onto the uh, warp beam. Uh, this is again styrofoam. And um, I covered with fabric in this. In this I covered with uh, paper towel. And I inserted a weaving uh, from the back. Um, this again was inspired, the one on the left was inspired by the um, housing in back home in India, the multi-story building and the windows and the stairs and the, um, it's from that series. And this is a more recent uh, piece in which I use the styrofoam again. This is a driftwood I found recently and I wove this with wire. And yarn, the weft is uh, all wire and uh, I think one strand of yarn too. And then when I took, took it off the loom, I could shape it and crumple it any way I like and attached it to the driftwood with wire again. Uh, this is a um, combination of ceramic and weaving. This was woven with sisal and reed again. I dyed it and wrapped it around the ceramic uh, formish. This, this ceramic form, I made it in a ceramic class and I wanted to combine it and make it into a sculpture. And this was uh, again, very experimental. I haven't done it again, but uh, if I do ceramics again, I'll be doing this again. Uh, these are panels I created on top over here. Uh, those were ceramics and then the weaving and the surface design, it came later. This was paper weaving. Uh, this was fabric and yarn and paper all combined in one piece and attached to the ceramic panel over here. Uh, this was a thicker weaving on which I, uh, this was another wishing tree on which I applied the tree, you can see with silk organza and tied uh, strips of uh, fabric to it. Um, this is to show, this was not woven, but it was a fabric and the, the on the right is the final piece and this is in the making. 
I use freezer paper for stencils and I screen print around the stencils with uh, a thing called discharge paste. It's a chemical which takes off the dye uh, from the fabric. So I started with the black fabric and I took off the dyes from these areas. So when I took off the freezer paper, these are the black areas that remained. It's a little confusing, but if you see someone working on it, the, basically the white freezer paper are the black areas. So when I took out the freezer paper, I was left with this black over here. And then this was uh, quilted, all hand quilted and uh, applique with other fabrics. Uh, this is to show you how I've used uh, other weavings with the paper weaving. In between, I cut out a, 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 an area I didn't cover with paper, but I wove a little tapestry over there. And this is all around is paper. In this, uh, this is paper weaving in the, in the center. And at the side, I have ikat and shibori. This is all hand quilted. The entire piece is hand quilted. Uh, this is in the making. Uh, this is a piece where it, this was woven with copper and paper and I stuffed batting in it. This was laid on the table uh, when this was in progress and uh, it's hand embroidered, hand stitched, hand quilted. And uh, I used some commercial fabrics, but most of the fabric is woven by me or screen printed or dyed. Um, these are some fabrics, some surface design. I was, I made these masks to raise money to send to India. Basically, I spent, I sent all the money that I raised uh, during the pandemic. I was making masks. And I was creating the fabrics. These all started with white fabric. I dyed them. I, I stamped them. And then I made them into masks. And I sold all the masks and sent all the money to India during the pandemic. Um, so I just wanted to show you a sampling of that. These are all, most of the stamps are made by me, except the real decorative ones. Those are the uh, wooden stamps from India, but the flat ones are made by me and they are hand, they were all hand painted after that with the lines and everything. So these were the fabrics that I created before making the masks. After I made those masks, I made these little pieces, which I stretched on uh, little canvases. They are about six inches by six inches or eight by 10. And I created the fabrics and I hand painted and um, screen printed them. And I was all the, with all these, I was raising money. These were all done during the pandemic and I was raising money to send them to India. Uh, these are my serendipitous weaving where I don't have any plans normally. I just use my scrap yarns and stash and um, I was uh, weaving with them at one time just a few years back. These were my Christmas gifts to friends and they are about uh, six inches by eight inches, most of them. I had real fun doing these because I, I had no plan in mind. I used to just sit on the loom and just weave with whatever I picked up from the table. <laughs> and then after I did that series, I did about, I think, uh, close to about 50 of these. And then I did these. I stretched on canvases because the fringes were kind of clumsy when I would exhibit them anywhere. So I thought I would stretch them on canvases and they give a much neater look to them. So I did a bunch of these also, which were like just six inches by six inches or eight by eight. I think these were uh, the bottom ones are, were eight by eight and these were six by six.
these were again like no plan whatsoever after weaving they look like almost like abstract landscapes to me in some areas i uh, while the warp was on the loom i painted with acrylic uh, paints with very dilute acrylic paints and i wove with them you can see some areas have just used crunched up yarns because i don't throw any any of my yarn waste or anything so those kind of give a different texture also in the weaving. These are again a series of the whole of that uh, kind of weaving. These are little pins that I made again. And little tubes. Uh, here is the transparent weaving which i'm doing now basically i'm experimenting with that and this is uh, basically plain weaving and i use an extra weft for the inlay which uh, creates the opaque um, areas like you can see in this one the these are the inlays that i'm doing on the loom and when i take them off and i uh, hang them about seven or eight inches away from the wall and if i have proper lighting these are the shadows produced in this one i put a backing on at the back because this was meant for a quilt show uh, so they wanted like two layers i think so i this i didn't use it as the translucent fabric but i could have um this one was one which was very very experimental and i don't know if you can see it on the on the right oops is the one that that was hung on the wall and this also has painted i painted on it while it was on the loom and i did some inlay on it uh, these are some while they are on the loom you can see that i paint some of the areas with acrylic and I do some of the inlay and some of these areas are open in the warp I space out the warp and when I take them off the loom um, they kind of sag and they give an interesting effect like you can see over here See, so these are the areas where I paint with the acrylic and then when I have woven it, it becomes kind of more subtle when I'm, I didn't do the inlay over here, but I did the inlays over in some areas that you can see the opaque shadows. And I did, did some applique also with the, I use my moms and my aunts and all who have my one of my aunt who has passed away. She was a, she was very um, she was my favorite. So I use a lot of her saris to kind of bring her into the compositions too. Uh, this was an installation that I did with the same technique with the translucent fabric. Uh, translucent weaving and the inlays and a friend of mine he wrote a poem which kind of uh, it shows how with the clothesline it's bound all over like all over the world women are bound by clotheslines because they use clothesline our grandmothers and mothers how they have used clotheslines through centuries uh, so the poem is about that and it was an installation it was a collaboration with my friend and uh, i tried to do different countries and this was like this reminded me of the room of the trees in rome the evergreen trees and this was more the mediterranean and this was more like mexico to me with the colorful houses this is not a very good picture but i couldn't find a very good picture but um the clothesline the, those saris all belong to my uh, favorite people my friends or aunts or my mom and uh, some of them has have passed on and I wanted to bring them into the whole composition and the installation. These are some examples uh, of the translucent weaving and you can see the shadows. I hung them all about six to seven inches away from the wall and they create these beautiful shadows. 
In this, the clothesline was a separate entity altogether uh, in front of the weaving, so it created shadows of its own. Uh, these are installations. These are again styrofoam cubes on top, and I attach the weaving in between. Um, these are again translucent weaving, and you can see the shadows they created. Uh, these were canvases, uh, which kind of served the purpose like these uh, squares, but then these were shaped again, and they created these shadows. And these are basically me with different uh, mediums working on different things. This is I'm painting on the patio with my daughter. Uh, this is at my bigger loom. And this was as painting on the wallpaper. And this uh, paint, uh, doing the inlay on my loom. This is the re most recent picture over here. You can see some of the maple leaves over here that I, maple seeds that I included in the weaving. So yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> if you have any questions. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering with all your experimenting of different kinds of media, do you ever have any kind of um, problem as far as hanging a piece properly or like something? Like, have you ever had pieces that don't stick together when it when you're putting in an installation or anything like that? You you just seem to experiment with so many different kinds of materials that I wonder if, I mean, I've oh, yeah. experienced. Yeah, that happens a lot. And that's something that's constantly, it's kind of, I call it like a troubleshooting problem, I think. <laughs> uh, yeah, when um, two things, Three things I keep in mind when I'm uh, kind of coming up with a piece. One is um, storing a piece. Like storing is a big problem. I don't like to take up big space because I don't have so much space to store big work. So that's why I don't frame most of my work. I like to hang them and uh, so that they can be rolled and they can be folded and stored. And also the hanging mechanism, that's something I have to keep in mind, how I'm going to install it and how I'm going to hang it. Um, like the, the translucent fabrics that you saw that I'm doing now, I had to come up with that, with that just that simple uh, thing. I couldn't find it anywhere for a long time. I struggled, I was looking all over the place for the perfect hardware. And then it came just like a like an eureka moment almost. I just took like um, metal rods from hardware stores. I cut them and I just bent them with pliers and that was it. Wow. So that's something it's like it's brainstorming, you know, how, how you're going to hang your piece. Uh, that's a major kind of... Um, what to say, like how you are going to, con when you conceive a piece, you have to think, have that on mind. How am I going to hang it and install it? If it is going to hang from the ceiling, from what it can be hung from. And I try to make my pieces very light also, so yes. that they can be hung from anywhere. And uh, first of all, it's easier to ship if they are lighter. It's cheaper to ship. ship. And also how I'm going to roll it. If I can roll it around a tube, that's the best thing when I'm shipping it. Uh, so those are things I constantly have in mind. Oh, thank you. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention that Jane mentioned yesterday is I don't buy a lot of materials now because I think we are we all collect so much materials, so I like to use whatever I have in my studio. If at all I don't have anything, then I go out and buy, but that is very rare. I try to use whatever fabrics I have collected over the years or even yarns. I feel like I can't use in my lifetime what I have. So I don't go out and buy a lot of materials, honestly. And I don't know, like maybe... 10, 12 years, I haven't bought 
I spent a whole lot on materials. You're saving the earth. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, um, I just, I have so many friends and I know so many people, uh, my, like much senior to me, they have passed on and, and they have left with so much materials and they I have friends who are struggling with uh, their mom's stuff or whatever, you know, like, and I'm, I have that on my mind. Honestly, I don't want to leave so much for my kids, <laughs> just materials. There are a lot of us that have that on our minds now. Um, yeah, we can certainly take inspiration from the use that you've put so many different types of things to such wonderful use. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Can, can you tell us a little bit about your garden? I mean, the fence is so spectacular. <laughs> that fence was a very, very old fence. When we moved into this house is about uh, more than 50 years old. And we, that, that fence was very ugly when we moved in here. And our agent said, oh, that needs to come down. And we thought, yeah, we were going to bring it down after we moved in. And then we figured that fence is a very solid fence. Even to bring it down won't be very easy, you know, to put it, uh, put it out in the trash or whatever. So one fine day I decided to paint on it. And whatever acrylic paint I had, I just went out and painted. I didn't even bother about anything. I didn't think anything. I just want, wanted to paint and I painted. And obviously in Michigan weather, after like two years, it all started peeling off and it came off. And then uh, finally I power washed it completely and put a primer and everything. I used the right exterior paints and I painted the whole thing um, with flowers or what, what you see now. And uh, it has held up for more than uh, 13, 14 years now, actually. Wow. Wow. Beautiful. But the patio, my daughter and I did that, but it's it it's not doing well because the snow sits on it, you know, for like more than two months. And in Michigan, what can we expect? <laughs> we used good uh, good exterior porch paint, but still it doesn't, uh, it peels off quite a bit. Mm. So it has a very wabi-sabi look now. It just doesn't look as neat as you see in the picture. <laughs> Is that the the uh, tile that you're standing working on? Is that what you're talking about right now? Yeah, it's a concrete patio, and we painted with three colors, just with the brush, like you can see uh, my daughter and I doing. Uh, it's it's um, we in India we do an ephemeral uh, floor painting, which is temporary. It's not usually permanent. We do it for uh, occasions and events. Uh, so we do it with this rice paste or rice flour, and it's not meant to be permanent, actually. We just do it occasionally. And there are many different styles all over India. So this was inspired by uh, the floor painting that we do from our area, basically. Uh, but we did it with a brush and porch paint, which is uh, none of that we use over there. We use it, we do it with our fingers and uh, with rice paste. Thank you. And any other questions? Um, Lily asked, how do you organize and store your supplies? There are so many and so varied. It's not organized. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, if you come to my studio, I have a very messy studio. <laughs> I'm not at all organized. I don't have so many bins. I have things all over the place. So, um, yeah, my I, sometimes I take time and fold my fabrics. But then again, when I'm working on something, everything comes apart and everything is badly disorganized. So every now and then I try to put everything in order, but it doesn't stay that way. <laughs> I'm not at all organized. Mm. Any other questions? 
comments. If any, of you, if any of you come to Michigan, please visit. I love people visiting my studio and my workspace. So if any of you are in the area, please don't hesitate to let me know and visit. I do that sometimes. Yeah. I think you need to enclose your patio so you can sit out there every day because oh, it looks absolutely. so lovely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the summer actually becomes my extended studio, actually. I spend most of my day in the, on that patio. So I'm working there, I'm weaving there, and I do stitching and everything over there. My dyeing and everything. <laughs> I can see why you would want to. Yeah, so if any of you are visiting, uh, coming to Michigan, please like, come by. I'd love to have you over. <laughs> yeah, well, let's see if there's anything else in chat. Nope, it's mostly thank you, thank you, beautiful, inspiring. Um, so on behalf of the Guild and myself, thank you so much for sharing. Thank your... you for inviting me. This was a real pleasure. I don't know if I could answer your questions or whatever, but it's hard to do uh, everything on Zoom, actually. I wish I could show you some of the stuff. <laughs>